You know, I've always said I like to follow a great worship set, but I don't feel like I can follow that worship set. So I'm just going to pray and then God, no, <laughs> you know me, I'm going to get my preach on here. So I want to make you aware of something. Wes was sick today. I don't know if we want to pray for healing or for him to be sick on Sunday only. I don't know, but I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> but isn't it good that God gives his spirit and his anointing to cover even when we don't feel up to serving and when we don't feel up to doing what he's called us to do? That's the message there. Amen? I got a story I want to tell you today. Today's sermon is called The Wind of Doubt. This story is a realization that many times we might have Jesus near us but not with us. This story paints a picture of something that I believe some of us have fallen into or we've, we've kind of walked into a place in our own personal lives and even our walk with God to where we're in proximity to the Lord, yet we fail to call on him when we need him. We, we fail to connect with him when he's so close, and it's not about him. He's always there, yeah? It's about us recognizing our need for him. I don't know about you, but sometimes I try to fix things on my own. Anybody else guilty? Try to fix things on my own, and then, and then, and then, after I've exhausted all of my resources and all of my energy and all of my efforts, I finally say, okay, Lord, <laughs> Can I get some help here? And I act like, I'm talk, telling on myself, I act like, God, why didn't you step in sooner? <laughs> you know, I played basketball a little bit growing up, and I was the best out of my brothers. <laughs> Especially better than Styles. But I remember the teaching and the idea of boxing out for a rebound. You know what I'm talking about. You, you push everybody else away so you can get the ball, right? And sometimes, even though we may not even know it, sometimes we find ourselves boxing out the Spirit of the Lord by trying to tackle the issue ourselves. When in reality, we really should be making room for the Spirit of the Lord to come in and to help us. You know, sometimes our biggest hurdle to overcome is ourself. <laughs> our biggest hurdle to overcome is ourself. Don't make me go back there and tell the guy I was telling last week. <laughs> Today's story is simply that. We see the story of Jesus calming the storm, but really addressing the wind that caused doubt in the disciples. Mark chapter 4 is where I'll be reading, verse 35 through 31. Let me pray before we get into the Word of God. Lord, I acknowledge the fact that anything that I personally want to say, need to say, is just nothing without your Spirit. So today, may you touch these words. May they be anointed of you. May everyone in this room and even those watching online be open to receive this message. Challenge us. Change us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Before I get going, you... You know the worship is good, Kelly mentioned to me. A good indicator of our worship being fire, being really good, anointed, <laughs> is when Sam starts running. <laughs> Sam came out a couple times and she just was doing laps. You couldn't sit still. And I love it. I love that we make room for her to worship along with us. <laughs> My dad, on occasion, would take laps around the, the sanctuary. And everybody thought he was crazy, including me. 
But I almost got there today. If I wouldn't have got a cramp while I was hopping, I, I might have taken a... I'm exhausted. I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Mark chapter 4. Beginning in verse 35, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon, there was a fierce storm came up. How waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped. And there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. We're in a series called Catch the Wind. And one of the things we discussed in our first week is that the wind carries with it other things. And in this story, we see the wind making the waves to scare the disciples. I think it's important to understand that the high waves there, it says in verse 37, were breaking into the boat and began to fill with water. But, but I would argue that the thing that the devil has sent to sink to, sent to sink you is the very thing that God is going to use to build your faith. The Sea of Galilee is where all of this happened. And to give you some context or some geography here, it was in a weird place. It's the lowest point in that area. And there were mountains and hills all around it. It was kind of in a bowl. And the wind would come off of these mountains and come off of these hills and down in the Sea of Galilee, it would kind of collect and it would go from incredibly calm to a storm with tornado type, hurricane type winds in this Sea of Galilee. So it's kind of like if you would set out, you may see, oh, it's nice, let's take a sail. Let's go across to the other side. And in a moment, you're stuck. It was only about 13 miles, this lake to get across, but in a moment, you could be stuck in a gale force type storm. The thing about the Sea of Galilee is if you traveled on there, everything either went really well or things went really bad. <laughs> Have you ever felt when you go to do something, there's no middle ground <laughs> in your life? It either is going to go really well or it's going to go really, this is going to be a great day, or this is going to be a day I should have just got back in bed. Many times we feel in those, we, we kind of recognize our days and our lives and our events in those extremes, really good or really bad. What I want us to see today is three questions that we'll be asking ourselves. Number one, what would you do? What would you do if you were in this situation? The disciples are there. So if you could put yourself into the story as one of the disciples, let's approach it in that way. What would you do? In verse 35, Jesus says, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Do you really trust what Jesus has already said. Let me ask you this question. How many in, your, in here today, you feel like you've had a word spoken over your life or a calling spoken over your life? You feel God has said something to you, maybe years ago, but God has called you, spoken 
There's been something in your life you feel like, hey, God's spoken to me, Pastor. He's called me. Somebody's prophesied over my life before. Some of you, God has yet to talk and speak into your life. Some of you, God has already spoken into your life, but you haven't been listening. You see, the thing about the disciples is Jesus opened with this statement, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So the disciples knew that Jesus had every intention to get to the other side. Yet, in the middle of the lake, when the storm came, they forgot what Jesus said. And sometimes we forget what Jesus has already said, that we are a child of God. We are no longer slaves to fear. Perfect love drives out that fear. That when we receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and we become a follower of him, there is no more condemnation. We forget these promises when we get caught up in the storms of life. But we can trust that Jesus said it and he meant it and he'll carry it out to completion. The disciples needed to just look back and say, wait a minute, guys, he already said we were going to make it to the other side. So why are we freaking out? Why are we so worried? Why are we so doubtful? I don't want you to forget the word that God has given you already. And today I want to believe alongside of you that God will speak a word into your life if he hasn't already. In verse 36, we see them leaving the crowd behind. So it was just them and Jesus. Sometimes we need that moment we're away from all of the crowds, all of the voices, all of the other influences where we're getting alone in the storm with the Savior. I'd rather be alone in the storm with the Savior than in a room full of people without him, amen? The final thing that I want you to consider on the what would you do is do you consider those around you Mark is the only narrative with this story. It's found in Matthew, it's found in Luke, but he's the only one that recognizes that there were other boats that followed. There were other boats that followed. You see, Jesus was going to the other side. The other boats knew Jesus was on this boat. They wanted to continue to follow him, to continue to get this teaching, to continue to be around the master. And yet, they got caught in the storm along with the boat that Jesus was on. So my question to you is this, do you consider those around you when you begin speaking negativity? Do you consider those around you that are also being affected by the storm? Do you consider that there's other people that are in proximity to your life that you can have a good impact or a bad impact on. Consider those around you. Consider your actions. Consider your words. You see, these boats were kind of in, a, in an area where they were around each other, and they could see. It was like a sailboat. It wasn't like a cruise ship or anything. It had about 15, room for about 15 people. So if I'm in one boat and I'm looking across to where the barn doors are, there's the disciples' boat with Jesus. And I picture in my mind kind of, a, kind of a Three Stooges type of scene, if I could be honest. So if you'll just add the cartoon circus type music, these disciples are running around in circles and they're throwing buckets off of the boat and they're beginning to freak out and they're running around like this and everybody's going, isn't Jesus on that boat? What's the matter with that? Hey, we should panic too. What's going on? You see, but in the storm... If the people that have Jesus with them would be calm, peaceful, at ease. If we get that report from the doctor that things aren't right, yet we have peace because it goes beyond anybody's understanding because we have Jesus with us. And as people are looking from maybe across the water and they see the disciples calm and assured, but they didn't. They saw doubt. They saw fear. They saw panic. I would ask you this. When you consider those around you, why is your life more appealing than theirs when they're away from Jesus? 
if your marriage, your relationships, your job performance, your attitude is no different than the one who is completely lost in their sin, then what is appealing about following Jesus? Right? Pastor, I I have bad days like everybody else. Yeah, you do. But Jesus is in your boat. (laughs) So there's got to be a difference. The Bible tells us that we are God's perfume. We, We are the very scent of salvation to those that are perishing. And when they see us, they should be attracted to the gospel not driven away by it. The second thing I want us to look at is what did Jesus do? If you read right before this passage in Mark, you understand that Jesus was teaching all day long. He was healing people, ministering all day long. It was a long, hard day. So it's interesting that Jesus was resting during the storm, but Jesus was at complete peace during the storm. Now, again, I've kind of explained a little bit about this boat. He was kind of in a nook with a little roof laying on a cushion. He wasn't in uh, the underbelly of the boat on a waterbed. It was a hard place to sleep, but you know what it shows us? It shows us Jesus' humanity right here. You see, because Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and and you you might want to say, well, God doesn't understand what it's like to be as tired as I am. (laughs) God doesn't understand what it's like when I have such a hard day and everybody's again. This shows you that Jesus does understand. He became human so he could relate to you, so you could pray to him and tell him how you feel, and he'll know because he's been there. He was exhausted. He showed his humanity here. He was at peace in this storm, and he was resting. In verse 39, something very interesting happens. When Jesus woke up, they yelled at him, get up. Don't you care about us? <laughs> Anybody ever ask God, God, do you see what's going on? Are you even watching? <laughs> well, I'll just tell you. <laughs> He recognized the spiritual nature of the storm. Hear me. I believe what's happening here because of the way the language is used. In verse 39, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked, say rebuked, the wind and said to the waves, silence. Actually, if you go back to the original languages, and I don't do that a lot, but if you go back to the original languages, the most appropriate word in English is shut up. frustration. Be still, he said to the waves. You see, the same language that he used right here against the storm is the language he had just used not too long ago against a demoniac, a a demon-possessed man. He rebuked the demons. And see, here, I believe that ever since Jesus started his ministry, the devil was trying to stop it, right? Right? If you read through Scripture, you see the Pharisees wanted to kill him, and they wanted to stone him, and this wanted to happen, and they wanted to put him in jail. But they they were never able to do it. Jesus was always able to slip through unharmed until the cross, which is the time he chose. I believe that the devil was making an attempt on Jesus' life. I believe that he was coming against him. You saying the devil can control storms? I know what the scripture says, and the scripture tells me that when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave the keys to this earth over to the enemy, to the devil. So I want you to know something. You cannot, with this hurricane, we cannot look at God and say, God, why do you send such a storm? The hurricane is a result of a fallen world, which is the devil's fault, right? And so I believe what's happening here is more than just a storm. This is, this is something so bad. This is so negative. This is so traumatic that it's demonic in nature. And that's why Jesus rebuked it as he would a demon. You with me? 
And the thing about demonic things and the thing about the devil is when Jesus rebukes it, they listen. I picture Jesus waking up and wiping the sleep out of his eyes and going, oh, come on. Did Jesus ever get angry? Of course. Righteous anger. Right kind of anger. He was angry in the temple, and he was angry here. Shut up! If it was me, it would be, are you kidding me? I just lay down, and the kids won't be quiet. I just got in the bath. Sorry, I'm a bath taker. I, you don't know that about me. <laughs> the disciples are like these toddlers running around. <gasps> I love how the Bible doesn't pull any punches, and it shows the emotion of the story. Jesus is angry because this storm had the gall to wake him up while he was resting. And then he asked the hard question to the disciples. Guys, do you not believe in me yet? He woke up, he rebuked the wind, said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. This wasn't just a calm from big waves to little waves. When it says great calm, it was probably like glass. It was so drastic and so amazing and so, so just shaking to the core that the disciples were looking at this thing going, what is happening? And then he asked them, why are you afraid? And they're thinking, because we're going to drown? Do you still have no faith. They had seen miracles. They had seen healings. They had seen demons flee when he cast them out of people. You see, Jesus had shown them that he had the power over these things in a personal level. Catch this. But he had yet to display that he had power over all creation. <laughs> Sometimes we give God credit that he can do the little things. But God can do anything. Anything. Well, God, I know you can reach this loved one because they're not really that far from you. They've only missed a couple of weeks of church. But that one, oh, I don't know about that one. God can do anything. Jesus established in this moment something that terrified the disciples. Not only can he heal that body, not only can he cast out that demon, not only does he have great teaching, but nature itself bows to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I think sometimes we need to listen to the Holy Spirit when he asks us that hard question. If you believe me for that, why can't you believe me for this? What are we now called to do? What would you do in that situation? What did Jesus do? How about today? What are we now called to do? What does your faith look like? Is your faith big enough to believe God for the great things that he can do, not only around you, but in your life, personally? <laughs> One of the most wonderful blessings that we can walk in is the fact that God uses people to accomplish his purposes upon this earth. He wants to use you. Can you say, God wants to use me? Can you say that? Come on, say it. God wants to use me. 
let that shake you to your core and embolden you at the same time. What does your faith look like? Have you ever caught yourself limiting God? He can heal my body. He can minister to my loved one, but God has never met my sister-in-law. Now, I have great sister in law so that's not a shot. <laughs> Don't limit him. Allow him to be God and you to be you. Don't pretend to know what he wants to do and doesn't want to do. Can you just trust him with it? Can you just let go of it? Can you just cry out to him? You're in the storm. Ah, teacher! I don't want to just be near you. I want to be with you. You know, the beauty of this story is while Jesus was both fully God and fully man, in this moment, his humanity overcame him. He had to lay his head on the pillow. But you know where he's sitting right now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you, which means you can call out to him anytime, day or night, and he will answer. Don't fear the possible storm in the light of the one who is with you. If the disciples knew the storm was coming and Jesus said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side, and they knew the storm was coming, I wonder how many would say, we'll stay here. If you had a glimpse of what you were going to face a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, would you still follow Jesus through it? Uh, isn't it cool that God knows exactly what we can handle? <laughs> and isn't it cool that he gives us the maturity and the grace that we need for today and trust that we'll be built and we'll be discipled and we'll be strong enough to face what's coming tomorrow? I'm going to tell you something. Some of you in here, God has such a touch on your life. God has such a call on your life. If, he, if, <laughs> if you only knew it was coming, God is going to build you, break you, and just do something so wonderful in your life now so you'll be ready for them. Our history wall out there it tells the story of our church. I noticed when it first went up, and I never saw this before, when it first went up in 1930, when the church started in a tent, in three years, it went from a tent to a tabernacle to, a, to an auditorium full of 3,000 people in three years. I wonder what God wants to do in three years at Greater Life. Know your influence. What are you called to do now? Know your influence. People are always watching you. They're watching your reactions. Have you ever looked around in the middle of your problem, your pain, your worry, and asked, where is God in this? I would argue that he's in the boat. He's right there wanting to show you something special. Could it be possible that the storm only becomes as rough is what it takes for God to teach us that lesson. Could it be possible that the storm is only as rough as it takes for God to teach us that lesson? Trust his destiny for your journey. The disciples experienced this fear as they got into it, and it says the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, I don't really know what happened after this, but I would just make a guess. After the storm calms, and it says here the disciples are terrified, and they asked each other, so they were talking. So in this little sailboat that they're in, and Jesus woke up, and he calmed the storm. He asked the question. He goes, I'm going back to bed. Because <laughs> here they are now. Did you see that? Did, did, did you see that? They were terrified. 
Why were they terrified? I would argue that if you don't have a healthy fear of God, then be careful. The God who loves you also has a belt. <laughs> Come on. And he loves you enough to discipline you to make sure you stay walking in right path with him. He, he loves you enough to allow you to go through things that drive you back to him. Fear drove them to their knees. Sometimes bad things happen. And the challenge is this, and this is what I pray for anyone facing something as I'm going into a hospital room or, or, or dealing with a death in the family or whatever the case may be. My prayer is, God, use this as something that draws them closer to you, not further away. You see, the fear that they had when they hit the shore could have driven them away. I don't want to go through that anymore. But I, I, I think about it this way. Had they not gone through the storm, they would have never experienced the miracle. So, so if you want to go through life and never experience the hand of God and the miracles of God, then guess what? You'll never face a storm. But if you want to experience the power and the goodness of God of your life, then expect things to happen that will put you in a situation where only God can intervene. Today, I really want everyone in here to meet Jesus for the first time if you haven't yet. I really want everyone in here to encounter Jesus again really encounter him. That question of where is your faith? Is your faith in the boat? Is your faith in your friends? Is your faith in the water, in the buckets that you're using to dump the water out that's now in your boat? Is your faith in the other boats and the other people around you? Or is your faith in the one who can calm the storm? Is your faith big enough to believe that even though you don't see it right now, you still trust God to do it? Pastor, you don't know how long I've been praying for it. You don't know how long I've been serving the Lord. You don't know what I've been going through. I don't. Most of you, I don't. Each and every week, somebody, not each and every week, but a lot, somebody comes and tells me, did, did, did somebody tell you about what I was going through? No. Because you are preaching at me. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord knows. And the Spirit of the Lord cares. Jesus cares. Here's the thing. We sang it today about being a child of God. Some of us have what could be considered a foster parent type relationship with God. You know, a foster parent is a wonderful thing. It gives a home for a child for a season. But it's temporary. And I believe that Unlike adoption in our society where the parent says, I want to adopt that child. Unlike that, in your situation, you have the opportunity to allow him to adopt you as his child. You know, if there's a piece of paper that says, sign here to become a child of God, Are you ready to sign that paper? 
your foster relationship as you show up at church, you pray from time to time, you think about it from time to time. I think the church has, has kind of done a disservice because we've invited people to pray and to say a quick prayer and then to go about their way. But a relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. It's something that carries over to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I, I want you to pray. I want you to receive. Here's a question. You may already have Jesus in the boat. You may already have a relationship with, you, with him. You may have already seen his hand. But somehow you've gotten to a place where you've forgotten to call out to him. You've forgotten to include him. You've forgotten to be with him. And maybe you're here today and you have never experienced the salvation touch of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to tell you something real quick. Here's what makes salvation possible. Jesus came to this earth, lived this life, died on a cross for your sins and mine. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness, receive the gift of salvation, become a child of God, and then walk with him day by day. Amen? So would you stand? Brian's going to lead us in a song. And then I'm going to call for prayer. Go ahead, Brian.